Welcome, YouTube watchers, to a review, uh, our quick hit special edition. We do this sometimes. We all see something and want to theme the whole section of the show around it. And this week, we are talking Marvel's latest film, The Eternals. Before we get there, I'm Christian, in case you haven't heard that yet. In the, it's weird doing con content. strange. Other people on the show? <laughs> Chris Conkling. And Brian Dupree, how's like it going, a, guys? Like a perfect host. We're doing great, Brian. How are you doing? Finely tuned machine here. You know what? I it's don't not know. like we've been doing this for three years. It's fine. <laughs> I don't know if you know about this, but we do things a bit different. All right, so we're going to talk. We're going to die. We're going to die. It's my favorite thing we've ever started. I started it. So uh, we, we all had uh, a fun time seeing this. We're getting back into theaters. COVID numbers are down. We're vaccinated. Things are looking like we're returning to somewhat of a bit of normalcy, but things aren't all okay at the movie theaters. So before we get into the review proper, um, but I do, Chris, you wanted to talk about seeing this movie in theaters because I've been seeing movies for a few for a few weeks. Brian never stopped. I just started maybe a couple months ago, and I've started regularly going yeah. maybe once or tw twice a month. Uh, sometimes three times to go see movies again. So it's great. A little matinee action. But you are just returning to the theaters. So what has your experience been seeing theaters? How was your Eternals viewing experience in the cinema? So uh, as I mentioned, my wife and I are currently in the process of moving and we are bringing some stuff to the new house. And I, I saw this as an opportunity to kind of visit some of the theaters that are uh, surrounding the new house just to get an idea of kind of what I'll be working with, you know, once once I move there permanently. I'm sorry. And it's uh, just getting sadder by the moment. I'm so sorry. Is there like the theater? I thought you saw it in the theater and close to your old house, but you're like, I'm getting the lay of the land. What's around me yep, now? Just getting the lay of the land. Okay, proceed. And I'm not going to call out the specific chain, but um, there's a luxury theater by our new house that I wanted to test out because, truth be told, call him out. five Dra minutes from them. our house. Call him out. What? Call Drag him. Out. Drag him. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. It's good podcasting um, when you name specific. There's, there's a theater that I don't think is so good by our house, but then there's also this luxury theater. So I was like, all right, uh, I'll, I'll book tickets for this theater. My wife and I will go on a Sunday. Hopefully there aren't too many people there. So we get to the theater. We get our concessions. We, we go into the theater. And... Uh, it's a Sunday. I should have expected this, but two families, two like giant families come in and sit in the two rows behind us. And, you know, I I'm sitting in the theater and they start playing the trailers and I notice that the lights still haven't gone down. And as the trailers are progressing, the families behind us are still talking and I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll give this, I'll give these guys a pass. Like they haven't dimmed the lights signaling that like the feature is starting, you know, most theater chains tend to dim the lights now before the trailers, but I get it like half hour of trailers who gives a fuck at this point. Right? So I gave that a pass. Sure. The lights finally go down. Eternals starts and uh, I start to notice that it doesn't seem as though the theater is using all of their speakers correctly. Mm. And despite having surround sound, most of the audio is coming from the forward facing speakers. So I've been, look, I've been spoiled. I've been wearing these headphones for the last few months at home, getting constant Dolby Atmos when I'm watching movies. What, so like, I'll you, admit what that. are those on your ears, by the way? Uh, the AirPods Max. Wow. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Flex, Absolutely bro. shameless. Whoa, I'm sorry. Flex, I'm sorry. Bro. What a flex. So that's that's the next thing that I notice is like the audio isn't great in this theater, despite them having the system to make it movie theater quality, right? Uh, and then my wife brings to my attention that the projection isn't centered. <laughs> oh my gosh. And it's actually a little elevated on the screen. So despite all that, I'm like, <laughs> fuck it, oh, whatever. No. Oh, no. So you're telling me part of the the visuals were uh, on off of the screen, a little bit on cut the off. Wall. Yeah, not not a ton, but like part of the visuals were cut off. Chris, can top. I stop you right here? Personally, because I'm going to talk about some personal things. But at that point, for that experience, I would have stood up and talked to uh, a manager. I, I thought about it, dude. You should have. I really thought about it. I think like that one, like if it was just the screen, if it was just the sound fucking both 
dude mm. that's, that's but rough. you know we've we've had conversations about how and, and i'm not saying that this makes it right but the three of us that have have had conversations about how like most projections are run by teens at this point and theaters don't invest in training these teenagers to make sure they know how to use the equipment it's just not worth their time and it, like i said it doesn't make it right they should know how to use the equipment in the theater but i wasn't going to get up and like cause a scene for this particular reason we had the family sitting behind us uh, so i was just like whatever let's just watch eternals um as the movie progresses, Mickey and I begin to realize that the dude in front of us is not getting off his phone and his phone is lit up for like 75% of the movie and the two families oh, behind no. us won't shut the fuck up the whole time. As if we're all just sitting in at their home on their couches, you know? And uh, despite all that, and, and we're going to get into our opinions of the film, despite all of that, I really enjoyed the movie. But my wife has been... On, on the side of cinema that like she doesn't really like going to theaters mm. you know that that's one thing that she and i don't really have in common and and that's okay because she wants but, to like, be on her I phone have always she been wants a... to be on her phone and i get it I, she's not alone yeah uh you know that that you know the three of us have always been big proponents of the theater experience like it's been really important to us since we were little uh and it's, it's part of who we are as people it's why we started this podcast because we love movies but honestly i walked out of that theater and I was like, I hope streaming wins. <laughs> like, no. like I, I now have equipment at my house that can like emulate. The at thought least wasn't, the theater can we return the dignity to this sacred place? It was, I hope no. this isn't even an option. I have to say, I don't know <laughs> if theater etiquette can return. I don't, I, I don't think enough people care about the theater going experience as deeply as we do for theater etiquette to make a comeback. I think it was on its deathbed before the pandemic. And now having spent the last two years with general audiences, not going to as many theaters, I think they've forgotten how to interact with other people inside a movie theater. Let's, let's okay. Okay. The Chris, we're going to, we're going to, we're in the breaks. We on had an Chris. experience. I'm going to, yeah, yeah, Brian, we... I want to preface your experience for listeners who don't know and watchers that don't know is that yes. you have been seeing movies for, a, for the entire, throughout the course of the pandemic at theaters that would have you, Correct. you have the most experience with the most diverse set of theaters. So I think you have a, a maybe a better perspective on theater going in general. I think he does. I have to say, but I do want to hear about Brian's last three theater going experiences. Yeah, I've had three in a row. So it's like, I've seen, so I will say I, I met my goal for movies this year. I'm at one Oh five new excellent. movies for the year. So I've been seeing them. And the last three I've had egregious instances of things, but I just want to start by saying the three of us saw Shang-Chi together. And I think that was a packed house that was enraptured by the the screen and we had no issues not shang chi uh we, you saw, mean we saw black widow together and, sorry sorry black, black widow, widow and me. fast and furious correct and fast and furious which and fast and furious those, had a real life dom any. in the theater we had dom in the theater it was, we did have dom we had a dom, dom cosplayer dom. So, <laughs> so um those like at some of the big packed screenings we had some good experiences there but okay so starting with eternals um I always get my tickets in advance, right? And I've been going to uh, screenings as much as possible that are as empty as possible. And I plan my viewings around when I can go to a theater that's not packed for the most part, unless, you know, I need to see something for the pod and um, have to make an exception. Um, in this case, with Eternals, and I wanted to see it in IMAX. So mm. I expected it to be relatively packed. When I got my seat, there wasn't anyone within like seven or eight seats um, a family ended up being two seats away from the seat that I was in. And I ended up moving one over. So we were three seats away. It was, I believe, a um, father, mother, and daughter. And they brought a full meal into the theater. A picnic. With, with ra foil-wrapped sandwiches mm -hmm. that were being unwrapped throughout the course of the movie while they were being eaten. And the daughter, who was closest to me, she coughed 20 or 25 times without a mask throughout the course of this movie. And I'm already, I'm prone to being anxious <laughs> these days, um, given where we are in the state of the world and the pandemic. And I was just, it, it was very distracting on one level. And it feels like people have gotten, not all people, obviously, but I get it. On some level, you get used to after two years, not being in the theater, being at home, being accustomed to certain things. So ultimately, I was able to enjoy this movie as well. But because of the other experiences around it, I went to Tampa Theater, which is a different one, a beautiful theater. Um, 
and a group came in as the movie is starting. So the lights are going down, trailers are over, opening credits are happening. And the man that's with these two women just pulls his phone out with the flashlight on and does a 360 around, which an undeniably gorgeous theater. It's a historic theater. One of my favorite places in Tampa, but the movie's on at this point. <laughs> and he does a full 360 around. They're just talking. They seemingly sit he's down capturing and, everybody going, what the fuck? <laughs> well, it was just me. at that oh, point. Sorry. I was the only one upstairs and these three people come and sit in my row and start recording. <laughs> And they're like, one guy we're going to piss off, who gives a fuck? (laughs) Yeah. And um, the two women proceed to talk through 80% of the movie, just legitimate conversation. And luckily, they were probably 10 seats away. So most of the time, I couldn't make out the words they were saying or the movie drowned them out. But it was just a realization point where I was like, oh, some people just don't... um, respect don't you. consume this experience the same way right. it's it's yeah. i don't even know if it's about respect i just think it's this is how some people enjoy watching movies uh, and that's and understandable but the theater has always had this like unspoken rule I agree. I mean, and sometimes spoken at the beginning of the theater which seems to have disappeared a little bit about like hey shut the fuck up and turn off your phone uh i don't know yeah, that I they seen any of those. have that and they should return it and be like hey remember you're at a theater but i think they're just like we're just so happy you're here buy a coca-cola yeah, they don't want to. They don't <laughs> offend anyone. Yeah, but yeah, I will say um, these three particular. In, in, the the latest one, a family came in an hour into the movie and was in the wrong theater. So that happens. Um, but aside from that, because I've gone largely because I've gone to uncrowded theaters, probably I haven't had a lot of ridiculously preposterous examples like these few. But it does seem to be a, a trend on some level, maybe. Yeah, and I realize there are larger problems in the world than like theater etiquette making a return. <laughs> uh, on yeah. Papa Hogs, we're, we're, it's we're the of... most important thing we could talk about. <laughs> but you know, I, I thought I thought it was worth mentioning, bringing up, considering that we're a pop culture film podcast, and and we talk a lot about going to theaters. And I just, you know, whoever's willing to listen, I wanted to bring it to their attention, I guess. But you know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, there's another theater by my house that I'm going to give a shot um, on weekdays and see if maybe it's a better experience. But I hope that, you know, this isn't a new trend. I hope that people return to movie theaters uh, and, and are a little more respectful of, like, the experience. But I guess we'll see. Yeah. Christian, uh, have you had any experiences? Like, I know your viewing of Eternals, you said, was, like, excellent. Yeah, I'm I'm very happy that one of us had uh, all positive. Okay. So the first thing I'm gonna Uh-oh. say is, Chris, I need you to I need you to put a marker of when we actually start talking about Eternals because we're putting this YouTube video out, and I just feel bad for anybody who's listening to this like they haven't I talked will. about the movie. So please do that for for the sake of our, our viewers. But I think it's worth mentioning the state of theaters. I think it's a great conversation. I have always had a problem with seeing movies. Now I think it's exacerbated based on my personal experience and, and, and what I'm hearing. Those from listening, people. Christian wears glasses, so you know he he's. Just- it's corrected now. I, <laughs> I've always actually had a problem with seeing movies with like a packed house. It always terrifies me if I'm seeing an opening thing because I grew up next to uh, uh, the the uh, a, a theater next to a, a high school in which a, a lot of kids love seeing movies. And I went to college in a party town and I saw the movies at the, the theater near the party town. So like I've always yeah. had a disrespectful version of the movies that's tainted by people not shutting the fuck up or turning off their phones and it's kind of been a constant thing i think it might be a little worse but i am actually just prone to these problems now where i draw the line is the theater actually failing to deliver like what i would say is an acceptable i'm paying 20 dollars a premium to see a movie in a live setting are you delivering on the audio and the video there? And that's where I've started to run into issues. Now, the way that I've... Do you mind if I jump in really quick as you mentioned price? Because you just reminded me. Uh, go, ahead, go ahead. Mickey and I, between the tickets for the theater and concessions, we ended up spending $60 for that experience. Yeah. And I could have spent $30 and made my own popcorn to have an infinitely better technical experience. Yeah. Than than what we had. Anyway, Christian, continue. No, and I think that's that price per enjoyability is is a very 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 good point. And uh, 
there's nothing better than a than a quiet theater and the screen in a dark room and rules that say don't be distracted immerse yourself in this so that all being said I follow, I've been following, since I've been back in theaters, the same logic that I've always had, which is, uh, and it's also cheaper, which is find a great screen where everything calibrated relatively well and go on matinees. So there's typically less crowded. The type of work I do, uh, I'm off oftentimes on weekdays. So it, it, it affords that. So I followed that rule. But it took me going to a bunch of theaters, especially with the state of it, to find one that was acceptable. And there's still problems. Like the viewing that I had, just to, just to throw this, everybody was very respectful. It actually had quite a few people in it. I would say like by, by quite a few. For a matinee, there was like 15, 20 people in a, in a bigger theater, uh, probably a 200 seater. And everybody's very respectful. Um, no one was talking. And it was it was great for that. I will say the theater that I saw in is one of these RPX Regal screens, which I usually go because they usually have an upgraded sound system and usually have the biggest projector that can do some I, uh, some IMAX uh, aspect ratios. So I I prefer that. Now they have what, what are called butt kicker seats, which is that they actually have a vibration motor in them. And so... <laughs> I will talk about this more, but every time there is a character talking, they mix his voice very low end to give it this gravitas. And uh, I barely understood what he said because all I heard when he would be like, <laughs> the vibration of the seat. So it's not a perfect viewing experience. That was the most thing, but it had nothing to do with anybody else. Um, and even just very quick aside, when I saw Venom at a different screening, there was one other couple that walked in who I think were just fucking the entire time that I was watching it. I don't know. They were very far up and I couldn't hear them. But when they came in, they said, wait hey, a this- second. Oh, my God. This is you just gave me a flashback to another <laughs> screening. I thought Brian was going to be like, wait a minute. You were in that theater. I thought someone was being attacked. It was out of control this was blocked out from my memory because i was in the front row or like the second or third row from spencer and i think it was two people who came down the stairs mid-movie just one the, the woman was screaming or something hmm. and eventually we heard them kind of like doing something outside like five minutes after they had left i was almost scared to turn around because i didn't know what was actually happening but christian yeah, that's okay. So maybe it's four actually in a row where I've had <laughs> ridiculous things happen in my movies. I'm but, on a streak. But like you, what's interesting about your story, though, correlates to mine, is that someone's, uh, th- they were talking really loud, like as the trailers were going, I was like, uh, this might be bad. But I like forgiveness in trailers. I actually don't give a shit what you do in trailers. I have no respect for trailers. So who gives a shit? Right. Uh, as we know. Un- un- understandable. Uh, and so the talking- same reason I gave the pass for them not not bringing the lights down during our trailer. Yeah, exactly. And the gr- a girl goes, a girl, which, oh, okay, I, I have one last thing to say now that you said that. A girl goes, is there anybody else in this theater? And the guy goes, yeah, there's one guy up front. <laughs> and he goes, okay. And I was like, faith is restored to you, man. <laughs> like, they said one oh, other, per- good, they literally good. mentioned one other person. Said, okay, well, quiet. Let's, let's not be assholes because this the kid is trying to watch fucking love thank you so much people for my venom now that being said that theater had terribly mixed sound similar issue to you chris where it was like all treble (laughs) and it was way too loud i was like this is actually hurting my ears and very sensitive these things and then the last thing i'll say is actually when i came i actually timed it because i have i've seen a few movies and i'm like i really don't like sitting through trailers so i left to, to arrive 20 minutes late all said and done getting my ticket going to my seat which was perfect because i came in in the last second to last trailer and there was like 30 minutes into the into the screening start time they were playing wow. the batman trailer which i have avoided and i was i was in the middle of oh. it and i'm just like i'm not gonna pay attention but that trailer what i can say is a very dark muted colors trailer because they they have little lights for the seats i did not i sat at the wrong seat because i couldn't see anything because the new Batman trailer was too dark and did not illuminate the theater so I could see where I was sitting. But understandable, <laughs> I came back late. Uh, I, I didn't. I have no idea what's going on in that trailer. I saw one shot of, uh, 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 what's his face, looking up at, at, at in the Batman suit. And I said, oh, that looks cool. Robert Pattinson? I saw Robert Pattinson. I think he might have said something. I don't know. I heard Jeffrey Wright a little bit. Anyway, I skipped a lot of that trailer. Thank God. It's for the best. We know you don't want to see uh, that trailer anyway, so... To end, I'd say my recommendation is find a habit where you can see it and you either A, have a respectful respectful crowded or medium crowded audience that you're like, oh, movie buffs go here. Find that screen and then also find one with good audio and stuff. And if you're having trouble, 
uh, finding the latter where people are respectful, like try to go early on a day, like a Saturday, or maybe wait a week for new releases, you know, do those types of things if you're having um, if you're having a trouble finding like a proper screen. That would be my recommendation. Any closing thoughts on screen as we're 45 minutes into our journals? Routine? No, you, you wrapped it up well. Okay, cool. All right, so let's dive into it. The Papaholics thoughts, and we're going to dive right into spoilers, uh, just so we can breeze through this, uh, on Marvel's The Eternals. Five years ago, Thanos erased half of the population of the universe. But the people of this planet brought everyone back with a snap of a finger. The sudden return of the population provided the necessary energy for the emergence to begin. How long do we have? Seven days. We're Eternals. We came here 7,000 years ago to protect humans from the deviants. Why didn't you guys help fight Thanos? Or any war, or all the other terrible things throughout history? We were instructed not to interfere in any human conflicts unless deviants are involved. By who? That is from the trailer for Eternals. Me. I told them. I told them too. <laughs> I told them Spoiler all the Spoiler alert. <laughs> Brian is a celestial. <laughs> uh, so Marvel's The Eternals. Who made it? Well, it was Marvel. We know. It's directed by Chloe Zhao, written by Chloe Zhao, Patrick Burley, Ryan Fip- Furpro, and Kaz uh, Furpro. Am I saying that right? Furpo? They're mm-hmm. cousins, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kissing cousins, maybe. You know what I mean? Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I already get scared when there's more than like a couple screenwriters. So that's first red flag. Uh, scored by Raman Jawadi uh, with a budget of $200 million. Grossed $175 million as of recording. Uh, should make it back. Uh, and it stars uh, Gimma Chan, Richard Madden, Kamil Nanjiani, uh, Leah... Sorry, my screen is so tiny when I'm doing these podcasts. Leah McHugh, Brian Tyree Henry, Lauren Rudolph, uh, Barry Keegan... Barry Kogan, Don Yogan, Lee, yeah. and Angelina Jolie, Sam Hayek, Harish Patel, Kit Harrington, Bill Skarsgård, and David Kay. I normally don't mention everybody, but there's there's a lot of there's a lot of superstars in here. What are we going to talk about? We're, we're going to dive right into spoiler opinions. Maybe go into our favorite moments, and then kind of conclude with final thoughts. Uh, so let's start off. Uh, we are again. Uh, we're going to just throw it right here. Chris, I need a graphic for that. Uh, We're going to be talking full-blown spoilers right off the bat so that we can get through this. Hopefully, you've seen it already. Uh, Let's talk about our thoughts. Chris, let's start with you. Your thoughts on Eternals. Divisive film. Splitting people's hairs. Very. Last time I checked, it has like a 46% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes and like an 80% audience score. And everybody's wondering Uh, what we think of it and not what it was like to go to the movie theater to see it. So, Chris... (laughs) Exactly. They're like, please, for the love of God, no one cares about your first world problems. Just get on to giving us your stupid opinion about Eternals. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. <laughs> what did I think of Eternals? Um, okay. This movie has a lot of problems. There are a lot of problems in this film. Uh, there, It's a large cast, so that makes it difficult for pacing. Uh, there are a lot of cast members that are underutilized. It's very heavy and dense mythology uh, in this film. But despite all those things, I actually really enjoyed it. The movie. Um, I I think there are some things that could be changed, but the cosmological uh, aspects of the Marvel Cinematic Universe that this film is introducing is so interesting to me that I was completely engaged for the whole two hour and 37 minute runtime. I think because Chloe Zhao asked Kevin Feige to go out and shoot in actual locations, there are some stunningly beautiful huge scenery in this film. Huge makes so much difference. There's this real really thing does. in the sky called the sun that Kevin Feige discovered, and it's 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 glorious. Yeah. He wears these hats all the time, and yet he's never seen the sun. It it make, it, it, it boggles <laughs> That's my just mind. Just for the stage lights, Chris. Come on, be real. <laughs> Why isn't that blue? 
It should be blue. <laughs> it should just be blue everywhere except for where our actors are standing. So I, I'm appreciative that Chloe Zhao kind of forced that onto the film because it, it, it makes a difference. There are some incredibly beautiful shots here in the movie. Um, I, I did really like the score. I thought the score was great. The film is going for a very, um, it, it's a very kind of human familial type of story. You know, you have these characters that have been on earth for thousands of years and have only been with themselves and each other for thousands of years. So they are kind of a, a, a pseudo family and there are very interesting familial dynamics within the set of them. Uh, some are more interesting than others. But I, I really did uh, enjoy the film a lot. I think all the actors are, are delivering excellent performances. Some of them are underutilized. I didn't even know Bill Skarsgård was in this film <laughs> before the credits rolled. Like that wasn't advertised at all that he's in this movie. And I don't know why. For those that are unaware, he's playing Crow, like the lead deviant that evolves over the course of the film. And truth be told, I think that's actually one of the weakest parts of this movie. I think they could have cut out the deviants completely and focused on the family dynamic and the shifting religious perspectives within their group in terms of like whether they want to stop the emergence or not. And that would have been a tighter, more interesting narrative. But it's a Marvel movie, so you have these conflicting ideas of you want your characters going boom, boom, bang, bang against giant monsters and then Chloe Zhao's kind of more human elements that she typically a literal with. nod to that is the um i believe he's an indian videographer that's with kumail nanjiani saying oh everybody needs a good action scene they literally like just call it out and say there needs to be an yeah, action Karun. scene here yeah yeah harish patel stand out gotta say fun time definitely yeah i i love those moments and those are some of the more mcu moments with kumail nanjiani and uh, and Kar the character Karun. Uh, they're, they're, they bring levity to the film, which I appreciate. I don't think that's a weakness of the film, but you can definitely feel over the course of the movie that they're kind of these two elements butting heads. And maybe that wasn't necessarily the case behind the scenes, but there are different cinematic sensibilities taking place here. You have Kevin Feige's Marvel sensibilities and then Chloe Zhao's sensibilities, and they're just not merging completely. You know, but overall, again, I really like this movie. It's Voltron, uh, but with think... a weird dick. Yeah, you're like, what's wrong? What's wrong with that? <laughs> but I, I, uh, I thought it, I thought it was fun. <laughs> what, what did or you vagina. Think? I'm sorry, Brian. I should have been more inclusive. Brian, what oh, did I you? Th I think I missed the joke. I, I was lost on that one. <laughs> uh, Brian, what did you think of Eternals? So I've come to uh, realize, especially with these long movies. Uh, the Brian's bathroom break model, um, something like Last Night in Soho, only a two hour movie had to take a bathroom break. Eternals 237, no bathroom break. I think this shows that it's definitely uh, kept my attention the whole time, even with the family picnic that was happening next door. And yeah, I ultimately had a really good time with this one. I appreciate the big swing that they're trying to do. Um, kind of going against the the typical Marvel formula a little bit. It, it was interesting having a getting the band back together scene after having just been introduced to the characters. I think that part of the movie can feel like we're doing things over and over and maybe feels a little elongated, 14 or 15 main characters too many. Um, I think like but... <laughs> maybe like almost two hours of the film is getting the band back together. You know, yeah, um, and obviously we have a bunch of stuff set up where we're hopping through time, and then that that portion of the movie we get a bunch of different landscapes in the modern time. So I do I did appreciate and have a lot of fun with the um, uh, world hopping, especially with Chloe Zhao. You know, highlighting that they're actually out in the world. It really brings um, brings out those landscapes and makes the journey feel real. Um, I love all of the um, kind of, as, as you called it appropriately, Chris, like ancient alien uh, concepts behind this mythology that all of the myths are based in real involvement of some sort with these, um, not extraterrestrial necessarily in this case, but um, celestial or eternal beings. All of that stuff's cool, little nods to, I don't even think they ever call it the the Emerald, the emerald Tablet of, of Hermes, but these 
kind like these esoteric um, mythical art- artifacts that they're just, you know, they're just part of the Eternals real world. Even, even deeper than that, I love that Makari is based on Mercury, who is Hermes. So it, it's just... Wow, they, okay. All the Eternals have these names that are based, like you said, Brian, in mostly Greek mythology and, and Roman mythology for the most part. Their names are just like shifted a little bit. But again, something like that makes perfect sense, you know? Definitely, definitely. Um, so yeah, ultimately, I think this is not one of my favorite Marvel movies. And there are things like um, Druig's arc that you start thinking about the implications of what's actually going on there. And it gets very tricky, very fast in terms of wanting to sympathize with that character. Borderline um, fascist. Well, explicitly. So we yeah. don't know uh, exactly what the dynamic is there, but it definitely seems like it could be it, like a Jim Jones sort of thing to, to bring it back to our weekly upload, like out in the middle of the woods, holding people back and, and being their God explicitly. Um, so yeah, there's there's a couple of things like that that get into kind of weird territory, but it continues. We went through all the Marvel movies. I watched we watched them in one month, and this consistent and it's implicit within the MCU. But this idea of questioning or out and out fighting God and going against the supposed set master plan, and I think it's I think this is part of why the movie is so contentious because this is really pushing people up against. And the movie is not super deep, although it throws a lot of stuff out Scratches there. Scratches the surface a lot of, of a lot of interesting concepts, but like doesn't, it's not willing, nor does it have the time, despite it being a super long movie, to like dig deeper into any of these concepts. Right, right. So it's like, on the one hand, it's bolstering the reality of human mythology. But on the other hand, it's showing that those things are actually working against us. So it's kind of muddled, but I appreciate it for, for the chance it's taking and how in a PG 13 movie, in a movie, in something that's geared towards children, they are taking these big um, pseudo theological swings. Um, lastly, and we get it. We get a hardcore um, sex scene. Just, I was, I was going to say, dear God, like, why do we even have it in there? Core? If it's going to be like that, we get shoulders and up, Barely in, like implied I saw women motion covering, is probably the best way to say. I, it. I don't know if there's penetration happening there. Covering their do- <laughs> covering their sons and daughters. I myself got a little horny with those kick buckers, kick kick bucker, kick butter, kick butter, kick kick butt seats. I'm sorry, I ruined oh. it. Oh I, yeah, there was more motion in your seat vibration. than there was between them. I'm sorry, I'm getting so horny thinking about it that I can't getting think a little straight. Worked up because of just Rob Stark on top of uh, Gemma Chan. The thing is, we get them. We get them two two times in the movie in 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 pretty touching scenes, full body pressed up against one another, fully clothed. <sighs> And oh. both of those scenes are way sexier than anything that's happening when we see their shoulders there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, it Agreed. just, it doesn't make any sense. Um, the fact that people are, that it's a thing. I don't know. It's just very strange. And the. Emma ah, Chan was letting the audience know, Hey, I'm comfortable. Which was pretty <laughs> hot. <laughs> well, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> She was like, was, yeah, totally consensual. And we were like, yeah, slow, consensual sex in a Marvel movie. And she was cheating on her boyfriend at the time with a no, guy who's not. just. That was a flashback. They had sex in a flashback. Yeah, they had sex way back. Oh. There goes my camera. Yeah. Sorry. Everything, Gotta blur out the with... sexy things happening on this side of the screen. <laughs> that was too hot. It's too hot for yeah, you two. Your, your, your camera's fogging up there, Christian. Uh <laughs> Yeah, all the everything between Circe and Icarus, at least relationship wise, is all I didn't in flashback. That. Okay. Um, okay. So, so every time we're in present day, and and you and I talked about this a little bit off mic in our chat. You you were like, because you brought up the same point. Everything she's being faithful to Dane for the most part uh, over the course of the film. Yeah, yeah. She's just thinking about her past relationship. She's thinking about that hot this. fucking missionary sex she was having. <sighs> in- <laughs> Flames. It just, yeah. And, you know, it's PG 13. I guess they get a lady so much. But yeah. um, aside from that, uh, standout performances for me definitely Kumal Nanjiani as King Go, um, Don Lee as Gilgamesh. My oh. God, tragic that he was taken from us. And come on, 
give us the sex scene between Gilgamesh and Athena. That's what the people are looking it for. It was not oh, in man. the PG-13 Don't taint cut. Don't the relationship. Their relationship is so beautiful. Just two mutual, two individuals who mutually respect one another and help each other through life. Like it's one of the most beautiful. For 500 years and they're not fucking anyone. Yeah, that sounds it's realistic. private, private <laughs> behind the scenes. They don't need to express it, you know, but. I'm yeah, just, I'm I, just I telling the you, there would have been more motion happening between them two. Far more motion than Icarus could ever imagine with whatever he was doing. <laughs> it's nerdy. Uh, right, and I'll just leave with shouting out again. Harish Patel as as Karun um, just brought levity throughout the course of the movie, the whole camera bit, and that yeah, allowing audience giving surrogate. us humanity. Exactly, yeah. audience surrogate. He was perfect. Yeah, I liked it. It was very uh, nuanced the way that at the end of the movie he goes, "I represent humanity, and humanity thanks you, Eternals. <laughs> Good day." <laughs> Brian, any other thoughts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. General view. Okay, no, no, I'll, I'll that, that moment that moment did kind of bring a tear to my eye. I'm not gonna lie. When he's leaving with Kingo, yeah, because Kingo's like, I wash my hands of this, I don't want to hurt you, but I still believe in Arisham. Stop uh, fighting! It's just such a genuine <laughs> it's just a, such a genuine um you know response from uh from his character that it, it really it was moving to me. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, right. I don't think a lot of people felt like no, this movie I, was moving I welled up a couple but... times in this movie. And yeah, definitely. given that I didn't know any of these characters prior, I think that's a sign of of a level of effectiveness for sure. Agreed. Christian, how do you how do you feel about Eternals? You know, the more we do this podcast, the more I realize that I'm a broken record and and at least I'm consistent. And that this movie the worst parts of it are all the Marvel things. It's I think it's the most directorial vision outside the Russo brothers, maybe being able to take everything that's Marvel and make it even more Marvel. Like their vision was Marvel and Marvel. Like you've never seen it Marvel the way that it's supposed to be. And I think that's what made, uh, you know, and we didn't have a little bit of this with the Avengers films uh, prior to Endgame and infinity war where they were like, we're Marvel. And Feige was like Marvel. And they're like Marvel. And they made the Marvel thing happen. And I think, We've seen it with directors who have fallen off, uh, like Edgar Wright with the Ant-Man series. This 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 clash of like, I have an idea for what these characters can be and what can happen. And I don't think we've seen a director win as much in this argument. Like, this is the director winning more than ever. But they still got to be like, all right, and she has a boyfriend because he's Black Knight who's going to be in the Blade movie. And that's going to be cool. And she's like, but like, I'm trying to tell the story about the eternal struggle. Yeah, but Black Knight is actually in the movie. But we don't know it to the very end. And it's like, OK, I guess it's in there for no fucking reason. It makes the whole movie worse. Now, when I watch Avengers uh, Extra Infinity to Infinity and Beyond War starring Lightyear, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be like, oh, it all kind of made sense. And it made, and if that movie's good, it'll be like, oh, a really good orgasm, you know, <laughs> very similar to the one we saw on screen. Uh, it's going to be a film. No, no, we, we don't get anything close to climax. Gemma, <laughs> Please, she, Gemma Chan here. was saying, <laughs> yes, I agree to this. And I thought that was super hot. Um, you know, it, it could culminate into something that's worth it in the end. And we've talked about what's worth it and all that. At the end of the day, Chloe Zhao got the most yeses out of out of out of Marvel to do her thing, but at the cost of adding 45 minutes of also yes. And that's what we're seeing. I really love so much of this movie. And then there's these parts that I hate. And I think the people that came across just super hating, I think are chalking up for the wrong reasons. They're like, this is this is Marvel getting way too woke. And I'm like, no. This is so far from the the problem is it's not a Marvel movie and you want a Marvel movie and that's cool that's why you like Venom go watch Venom again you know you you didn't get a Marvel fun movie you got this big thing and then it had Marvel elements and yeah I there are problems that can definitely be said and I think all of them are the fact that it also had to be a Marvel movie and I say this all the time but it's it's never been clear of a director being able to get away with a lot in a Marvel universe and trying to tell something really cool. And also the, well, make sure we have enough jokes. Because although I agree, Kumail Nanjiani is the, is the fun part of the movie. And I don't think he can't be fun. It's that there was fun at the wrong moments because we hadn't had anything fun for a while. 
that ruined the tone of what the movie was going for. And you constantly see this throughout. Brian, you were going to say. Oh, no, no. Continue, continue. I think I think to wrap up to to to, to really d- distill it down to is that like the movie does so much well. I think the third act is really great, which shows that the overall idea was good, and that's always a good testament. We talk all the time when Marvel movies are super. I was having a great time, but when the movie tried to like land, it was like we didn't really build it anything useful, and we're like, oh yeah, it's just a powerful dude who learned to know his powers, even though he lost a bit of them, he's got them all back. Has to beat the dude that was the bad guy, and hope you know whatever. This movie is more than that at the end, and I think is the strongest in its third act, which is, which is a sign that the, the concept is really, really good. The problem is, is so, so much of this Marvel shit holding it down. If Chloe Zhao just had to write the Eternals comic book thing, the movie uh, would have probably been a, a, a near great movie like it for as it stands it's fine for a marvel movie i like ideas that it has it kind of fails as a marvel movie and as an art house uh you know mythic movie because it really is this yeah, big this weird in between and that's why it hurts for like both people even people that like it are like i like the ideas because it wasn't just marvel but the marvel shit made it bad and the marvel fans are like it wasn't enough marvel and uh yeah that's what which makes- is weird because i'm a huge marvel fan and i'm leaning more toward the former because it's I, like give me more of these really interesting yeah. concepts we've never seen in the mcu before but it's the it's the having to di- it, i mean it's the cake and eat it too they're having to dip back all the time and go like well why weren't you around eternals like well we said we wouldn't it's like well you had a change of heart because of the end of the world now but like what's the end of the world before it's just convenient because you have to be in this greater narrative which is the constant challenge and what they've pulled off really well but you know these movies suffer and it's just it has to be said that like your movie about like humanity being involved with like all these uh, ex- my- mythical creatures that were here these mythical beings that were here the whole time the movie's gonna suffer because it has to also be like but also like thanos and spider-man came here and you know kit harrington's actually a secret character and here's this guy star fox no one knows who the fuck that is but it'll be fun later we promise and it's like okay but he's thanos's brother he's thanos he's thanos the brother of thanos you know this dude that is not literally how the, he's a fucking adopted brother thanos is a big purple fucking <laughs> he's he's not an adopted brother thanos is a, is a big purple to. toe what the f- star fox so, is harry styles from one direction so what <laughs> like i'm sorry thanos, he's canonically from one direction in the mcu surprisingly enough thanos was in so one thanos direction. and eros are children of two eternals and the reason thanos looks different is because he has a deviant gene which is why he looks more monstrous and less human than star fox does makes movies a 10 out of 10 now i'm so sorry i was wrong uh <laughs> they don't explain any of that entirely in the movie but yeah i like it's, it's in the comic books you know i surprisingly even brian you had said like hey special effects you're gonna have some qualms to be honest just the layout of how they built up the characters abilities and the special effects i think i think it's actually marvel at its best uh i i, I okay. love wow. i I don't love every action scene, but I think how they progress characters without having to tell us of like, well, he has the doom fist and the doom fist is capable of a fight. And I know it's not called the doom fist. I'm sorry. That's actually another character, but like the idea that they didn't have to like X, they didn't talk exposition about every single thing that was happening. It just learned. And I think there was a real genuine, like, like, uh, Cersei, who has a horrible place name for having two game of Thrones characters in it, by the way, uh, Cersei, her powers are cool, but they're also like she's vulnerable, and every character has this vulnerability right. to them, even Icarus, right? And I think all that's very smart. I, I think that's really well done, and a and a very uh, kind of that's Marvel at its best. Marvel's oh, I think has excelled at this part, and I think this movie shows that as well. I want to shout out what debatably my favorite visual effect and moment for for Cersei. I think Gemma Chan is doing great here. Um, I don't think she has the most exciting role within the context of the movie, but the moment when she kind of learns that she has more power than she realized when she turns the deviant into a tree, that was nearly like horror movie level messed up stuff that was really yeah. effective for me. And I wasn't expecting it to be that grotesque. I, so I really dig the uh, the design of that tree. 
because in the comics when she turns something into a tree it looks like a tree but the fact that they kept deviant elements in the way the branches branches are coming out right you're right it looked horrific in it, its design yeah. uh and i appreciate that they went that direction instead of it just being like a regular tree they went but one direction cool. am i right they did go one direction <laughs> At the very end of the movie. All right. So uh, just to, to kind of keep things rolling along, I, I don't I think we all have our qualms. I think we all enjoyed it, though. And I, I, I do say, like, I prefer this to <laughs> I always bring up Ant Man and the Wasp. I prefer it to Marvel. Dude, I would like, watch this a million times over Ant Man yeah, and the Wasp. Just like play the hits. I try stuff. It's just always going to it's how do you do the Russo Brothers thing, which is like, let's find a way to have a singular Marvel vision about what great looks like. And I think that Chloe Zhao had too much of a what would cool mythic look like without maybe blending it. And it's tough. Like it's not easy and clearly directors have disagreed. Um, but I do appreciate the effort certainly. And there's a lot to love in this film. So let's talk about some of the stuff we love because we want to celebrate stuff here. Chris, what are some of your favorite moments? Before we move any further, I, I do want to point out uh, Brian Tyree Henry's character. Fastos is a standout in this film. I think he's delivering an excellent performance. I think his interactions with humanity are impactful. And the fact that he is this character that creates technology to help humanity progress forward. But every move that he makes essentially uh, ends in disappointment and tragedy because of how humanity ends up using his inventions. So I really like that dynamic between him and us as a species. But I, I think, think my, if I could favorite... comment on, on, on his performance, because you, you brought it up. Yeah, absolutely. Uh I like his performance. I like the idea of his character. I think it's because his his climax, so to speak, of his character development is him. It like at, it just cuts to Hiroshima, and he goes, "My science! Look what it's done!" It's like those ideas are so cool, and showing them and having us feel it is so much more impactful than having him just say it. And that's where. Uh, Despite what I said about the powers, falls apart that, that moment comes out of nowhere and feels so not earned for me, unfortunately, when it's like one of these giant moments in history. Um, yeah, that, that was unfortunate. But, but I think no, I think, I think the, the moment is, is improved though. by just Chloe Zhao's vision and just him like crying. And having Ajax come up and say one thing about condolence just as a, on a personal level and then cutting away to him in a different moment. And we're just we're living through his memory. Like, I think that works yeah, yeah. with just a lot less because when I saw it, I said, oh, my God. And I'm thinking all these things and feeling it I'm like, oh, my God, he must feel so responsible. He must feel responsible for this. And he's like, I'm responsible for all of this. And you're like, yeah, yeah. OK, yeah. He, OK, he definitely feels resp so whatever but it is it's also this moment where he admits that you know those that he believes he was sent to earth to protect are not worthy of being protected based on everything he's experienced up until that point and then we get a character turn once we learn that you know he's married and has a family and has learned to uh you, you know believe in humanity through them again but which I, I do think is a beautiful thing it's just like the on the nose part that's really bothering because at the beginning you get this awesome thing where yeah. you know they build a bronze knife and hand it and there's this concept uh we we're going to be covering a rival on our main topic episode there's there's this confusion in that movie about weapon and tool as languages and i think the root of that gift to humankind of tool also weapon is something we struggle with we talk about algorithms technology we talk at tool weapon we're still having that conversation. Right. It's a deep philosophical conversation. Um, I just prefer my characters not to say, like, we're having the conversation. Did I hand them a tool or did I hand them a weapon? You know, it's like, OK, <laughs> I get it. Got it. I get it. Anyway, on a uh, um, favorite moments. He, his performance is great. I want to end on that. I think he's great. Um, and his redemptive arc when he when he fucking grounds Icarus. Very cool. Oh, so cool. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. So I think it works in the end. Speaking of Icarus, uh -huh. again, I don't think I have necessarily favorite moments in the film but i i really do enjoy a, a large swaths of the movie for instance uh icarus's arc i really appreciate what he brings to the movie being this like devout person to erisham uh, unyielding in his beliefs to this god to the point where he'll murder his family and what that brings to the rest of the eternals and the conflict that it creates between them i i really think it's this interesting interesting conversation that the film is having about uh religious devotion and like how far you're willing to go and uh i i just really enjoyed his arc at the very end 
when they kill Tiamat and he realizes that he has killed one of his gods, um, he can't live with himself. <laughs> and instead of harming anyone else, he just chooses to destroy himself, basically. And I, I literally can... just like threw my hands up and I was like, Icarus you flew into, into the, the sun, sun, guys. Icarus, He's Icarus. Into the sun. Yep. <laughs> you flew into it. Not too close. <laughs> Uh, directly into it <laughs> straight on <laughs> but i really i really do like um the the struggle that his character goes through trying to balance these two things and and i think it's i all of us complained that they kind of dropped kingo for the third act kamel john nanjiani just chooses to walk away but co contrary to that opinion i do like that they have a character in the movie who is kind of a fence sitter you know, not everyone can be one side of the spectrum. Some some people are in between, you know, and, and I do appreciate that, that the movie decided to go in that direction and have somebody who's like, I'm not willing to give up my beliefs, but I'm also not willing to hurt you for them. So I'm just stepping away from this. Uh, I think. And yeah, they had to I get rid love, of the funniest character. <laughs> I love the concept of it. Right. I do think doing it is bold. And Chloe Zhao, actually, I read an interview where she was like, I this is how I would feel right. I would be devout to my belief system, but also not wanting to cause violence. Like, think about it. Right. It's a it's a, it's it's a nuanced character that we read. It's the first time in a Marvel movie where someone's like, I'm not going to take place in violence, which is crazy for a man who has finger yeah. guns. I think that they could have incorporated him in the action in a way that was him struggling with that, which would have been more interesting. Like, how are we t telling this story through action to just remove him from the conflict entirely uh, feels a little cheap. And and him actually having to be like helping people, but not actually taking a side and him having to struggle with that, I think would have been cool. And I think it's missing that element in it. And he's certainly missed and his energy's missed. And you're kind of like, I think the movie kind of, and maybe this is because of things that have come before it, we're thinking he's going to show up and be the person who inevitably, uh, inevitably turns the tides in some way yeah. or, or just shows up unexpectedly. And he just never comes back until he's like helping, um, you know, Cersei move. He's like taking Sprite to school, basically. It's like, all right, I'm going to drop you off. Nothing happened, right? We're still cool. So I feel like it doesn't address that relationship super wholly. But I do agree that I like that that idea is there. To, to bring up, to, you know, to talk about that moment a little bit, I, I do like the interactions between all the Eternals and how they don't... Yes, the movie's kind of glossing over the fact that he left, but the fact that Sprite and Cersei don't hold that against him in any way feels like a real family. You know, like when you get... Sure. And, and I think it was uh, Devendra Hardwar from the, the film cast brought up that this movie's like a Thanksgiving dinner basically where you have your family coming together and they have all these varying perspectives and they love one another but there are going to be arguments around the dinner table essentially and even the fact that uh Circe doesn't hold sprite stabbing her in the back <laughs> against her like they're they're still family um and and they still care about each other i just appreciate that about the dynamic surrounding everyone in this eternals cast yeah, I think that's really this probably the strongest character stuff that's happening here. Um, I don't know. I, I'm si similarly. I've only seen this once, and it's been nearly a week. So in terms of favorite moments, I think the the moment where Cersei turns the deviant into the tree was probably the moment that stuck with me most in terms of the, uh, an image that that was powerful and affecting to me. Um, aside from that, yeah, I mean the concept of just the large concepts about humanity's purpose and how there could be this underlying um it's it's been done in the matrix right in terms of humanity being used as an, an energy source for a a big um debatably good or evil power depending on your perspective on it um i just really appreciate them taking these swings even though ultimately i'm not sure I know these are comic book movies that are made for teenagers, so you shouldn't take them too literally. I'm not sure I tend to agree with the philosophies that Marvel movies espouse um, in terms of this one. They are definitely pointing to violence as one of the main driving forces behind humanity, which there's some uh, truth to that in terms of technological growth. I think humans are more than technological growth in terms of um, ultimately, but 
Historically, we mark I uh, ages by the levels of technology growth. Tools. You know, yeah, so. Yeah. Right. No, 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 for sure. Most definitely. But uh, it's presented here as based in fighting, which I guess largely historically has been has been true that tools are developed for weaponry. But what I did appreciate prior to getting to that point, even though the first tool that they give is a knife in the context of the movie, at least, um, is Fastos's character uh, kind of getting ahead of himself and creating a steam engine when they just need a, a plow. Um, and that kind of thing, like the functional, like wanting to speed humanity up faster, but not being able to because of where they are. I think that's really like fun way to deal with these sorts of big ideas about attributing technological growth to mythological beings. Um, I think I, I had a lot of fun with, with the implications from that, even though it's really that scene only. And then, uh, the Unimind stuff later, he's clearly brilliant, um, but yeah, I think um, going for those sorts of big swings is kind of what I liked most about it. Um, the character stuff, I, I, you know, I will say I'll shout out the the dinner table scene or when they go to um, Gilgamesh's house where him and Thena have been um, getting them all back together around the table, the spit beer. It's a classic Marvel moment, but it felt like a time where I was like, okay, like you said, this is a family. These people have known each other for thousands of years. Like I get it. I, I buy into the universe here. Yeah, I'd agree. I think, I think all the big familial moments for me are working and what the glue that holds this together in, in terms of its, um, it's, it's whole piece maintaining as as fraught as it may be throughout some of the the more ludicrous parts um i really like there's a moment this is my fun marvel moment where uh where kumail nanjiani's uh character gets under one of the deviants and goes pew and shoots him with his finger guns and then he asks <laughs> his friend if he got it you know on video and such a such a like this is what's working with the Marvel stuff that that I love. So I would be remiss if I didn't say, oh, what a fun moment to have. I really do think I want to shout out overall. Like I love the fight choreography and all that as much as lame as lame as it is as much as lame as lame as it is that it's just like mutant dog monsters like the entire time like generic you know bad guys. I do like the fact that they do I think threaten our characters in a real way and I think that's always important and the characters handle it in their own unique way which I think develops their characters more. So I just appreciate all that and I think it only gets better. I think the opening one I liked I actually liked what they're going for. They're showing off the powers. They're very competent. They're taking them out very clearly and like it's not supposed to be dramatic. It's supposed to show oh my goodness the mighty Eternals are here. And I think it accomplishes that and then we get them separated and when they're not together they're not as strong and I think that's a consistent theme in the action throughout. So actually as far as action goes in the MCU, I think this is for big superhero action. Uh, like I had said to you, I think they're taking a lot from Man of Steel, especially that last fight on the beach. Um, mm. With you know, well, with Chloe Zhao explicitly stated in an interview that Zack Snyder's Man of Steel was an inspiration when she was crafting the character of Icarus. You can wow. see it, and I I think that work, what works well is that although like there's a lot of unbelievable things and it looks like clearly CG, it's still again, I always always bring this up if it's something from this world try to make it look real with miniatures or something real or do be very deliberate about your camera tricks if it's something un not from this world ground it and and use whatever you can to make it come to life so the deviants are clearly something that doesn't exist so we're not comparing it a to b to something else so i think even though they have that they do this thing where i, I remember too there's a point where icarus is pinned against the ground and the thing is like one of the dog monsters is grabbing and it's literally like shot for shot the bear fight scene from that Leonardo, Car Leonardo DiCaprio movie The Revenant The Revenant yeah, like, that's, that's true they're getting yeah. in close they're kicking up dirt in our face and it feels grounded and it like it feels like our characters are at peril despite their superpowers so I do think the overall vision of these heroic characters and how their powers fit in with each other you know like I was thinking the whole time I'm like oh they don't have Ajax they can't heal like they automatically lost See, so much stakes, right? There, yeah. It's hard to believe that the stakes actually are pretty real, given like how little we knew about these characters going in, and we have to kill a couple of them off in the process. But I think it does have stakes in a way that some of these are like grounded stakes in yeah. a way that some of these bigger movies. That's that's a good point, and that's why within, I've heard within the context and the the information we are given within this movie, 
the stakes definitely exist. If they introduce, wow. and they briefly mentioned it in the movie, they mentioned the World Forge briefly in the movie. If they move further with that concept and what it means for the internal eternal characters, no one can die. They can just be basically rebuilt and their memories put back in their bodies, essentially. Well, there's still but drama. In, in terms of what this movie does, without telling us that, there are stakes. There's still drama that I think you can uh, derive from that. And I think that's what Marvel, Marvel's done really well in comparison to D- DC. Is like, these are big mythic characters, but they still made them limited in their power. Like when, And that's why I think people criticize the first action scene. And actually, the first action scene is showing you together they are unstoppable against the force that they were directed but you split them up and now it is much harder and i i do think that out of all the especially compared to the dcu of you know superman these god like beings like i think this movie handles that very smartly and i want to give it all the credit in the world i think all that stuff is very enjoyable it's uh, a lot of the stuff in between uh that maybe doesn't add up so much but overall really great go ahead this- Brett. I just this movie is so big, and as we talk, I'm remembering more and more. There's a bit in this that's it's ba- it's literally an X Files episode. Um, but the fact that the deviants come back because the ice is melting, there's like this pseudo environmentalist <laughs> climate change thing happening. But it's mm-hmm. also like kind of an overpopulation narrative. So you kind of start digging into the implications of what this movie <laughs> is saying, and it's a little bit troubling, maybe. Um, but I did appreciate this kind of like, oh, the ice caps are melting. What the hell's in those ice caps? <laughs> <laughs> Captain America too. All right, we've gone very long. I think just love to uh, a, a lot, a lot to love, love to hate in this film. Any final thoughts before we close out for this episode? My the only thing I will say in closing is that if you saw this movie and immediately were like, this is garbage, like I hate this movie, give it a second chance. I, I honestly do think this film deserves a second viewing for a lot of the from a lot of the people that are kind of immediately writing it off. I don't think it deserves all the critical hate that it's getting. And and I typically align with the critics. You know, uh, I I usually agree with the the Rotten Tomatoes score from the critics for the most part, but I, I don't this time around. I think it is uh, more deserving and it deserves a little more praise than than what it's been given thus far. Give it a second chance. Even the people that yeah. like it, I think always. I've heard nothing but measured appreciation of, of what similar to what we've seen. I mean, we just did the same thing. Yeah, you're not on Twitter nearly enough. It's like, <laughs> well, I mean, that's the problem with Twitter. It's like I'm going to have an outstanding. No, like, I know the best film of the millennia, or you know, MC. I I saw. Oh my god, friend of the show, Darren Vance. Love you so much. But he had posted like he said, posted, "Welcome to my TED Talk." Uh, and it was, it was welcome to my TED Talk bit. It was uh, Eternals is the worst MCU movie. I'm like, it's, uh, cool. Oh, no. Spicy. Darren. I would love to, to get him on at some point and talk about it. We should have had him on right now. Uh, we can, uh, maybe we can go in the past and change things. Brian, your final thoughts on Eternals. No, I, I'm in the same boat. It's like there was, there's a lot of conversation about this movie, a lot of hate that seems relatively unjustified i would say it's probably it's definitely not as bad as the critical score on rotten tomatoes and i wouldn't say it's as good as the the audience score but this is easily a 65 70 movie for me like definitely very watchable has more than enough to dig into if you like these sort of movies and it's definitely something you haven't seen in the mcu um in in more ways than one so yeah definitely would would recommend it yeah, full agree. I think I will say oh, the woke stuff. I mean, somehow the kiss between the two gay guys was even more milk toast than the shoulder sex scene. It's like two things that got overhyped to such a ridiculous degree. That was like a peck. It's like the fact that this is getting banned in countries. We don't have to get into all of this. It's completely, but it just seemingly was completely normal. It's hard to believe, but so it goes, right? Yeah. No, I was like, oh, that's the thing. But, I mean, to be fair, Disney has edited out gay characters in their stuff when they ship it overseas. And this was the first time that they didn't. And, oh, my goodness. They're pushing it down our throats by having them exist. Anyway, uh, I, think, I, I, I think this movie is definitely more worth it. I 
I appreciate shit like this in the Marvel Cinematic Universe than like 50% of it. I will take this any day over, oh, I had fun. Path. Okay. Yeah. I would take this over, over, oh, fun. You know, which is what a lot of the MCU offers a lot of the time, you know? Uh, but then again, I defend, I, I, I hate Iron Man 3, love Iron Man 2. So, you know, what, what do you want from me? I'm a, a little bit of a cheeky <laughs> film is subjective if you think if you truly think it's the worst of the mcu for you we can't take that away fine. from you nor should no we. it's exactly 72.5 yeah. percent good brian that's how <laughs> art works you're right you're gentlemen right. where can people find more of your work on the internet you can find me on twitter at chris conkling and you can find me at true papaholic and you can find me at Midnight Satire, new music video for Positive NDA, link in the show notes. Follow us there. We got all the social medias linked down below. This was a special bonus quick hits where we talked uh, exclusively about Marvel's The Eternals, as we tend to do. And uh, yeah, you know, in, pa- in closing, I'm really glad that this wasn't an eight-part miniseries. Give me the 2.5-hour polished turd. I'll take it any day over this being an elongated eight-hour. Polished. Turd. Well, it was a thoughtful okay. turd. It, dude, sometimes turds can be good. It was a thoughtful turd. Oh, my god. You gosh. ever take a turd and you're like, Phew. that's actually pretty sad. I'm glad that turd existed. That is a deep turd. That's a deep turd. Um, that's that's cruel. I don't mean to say that. Anyway, that's Marvel's The Eternals. Uh, we're going to move on uh, for the rest of the show, but you got to subscribe to the audio feed to see, to see the community feedback shout outs. So that'll do it for the episode of the YouTube part. And what is reality? Huh! <laughs>